I bet you thought we were done, didn't you? Surely there can't be any more dead space. You buffoon. You abs- Anyways, well after this, sad to say, you are correct. But we do got time for one last hurrah. What was an early sign for humanity that necromorph outbreaks weren't really just a fluke? Well, besides the fact that the markers were alien tech, and that we knew that, at least concerning EarthGov. Well, a major clue was the overall attack pattern and how specialized necromorphs would arise. Two in particular were known as aerial denial necromorphs. The first necromorph is known as the Guardian, and were placed really, or just actually kind of glued, themselves to enclosed hallways or near heavily trafficked doorways in order to block off entry. Using their tentacles, they would jab out so quickly it could completely sever the helmet and anything contained within that helmet, like a head, from the rest of the rig armor. These were typically males, but if you want to see a breakdown on those creatures, I'll link it at the end of the video. However, keeping the inside of the ship locked down wasn't enough, and considering the game is called Dead Space, other forms of creatures were needed to keep the Zero-G environment in check as well. Enter the Nest Necromorph. This creature is usually found in areas without gravity and can sense humans who are not infected as it opens up and flings homing projectiles. Seemingly, it's not just humans it can sense, but also vehicles as well, making it a much more heavy necromorph in terms of stopping power. So today we'll be covering the lore and morphology of these creatures, as well as where do they come from, and what sort of projectiles they seem to be hurling at everyone who just happens to be taking a spacewalk. So with that out of the way, I've been avoiding covering this last necromorph because I didn't want the flame to die out. But with negative atmosphere in the works, which if you haven't seen that game or heard about it, I would highly advise going and checking it out, I sort of figure it's time to close the book on Dead Space content and then finish up with this final necromorph. I know, don't cry. There will be more monsters to cover in all their grotesque glory someday soon. But for kind of refreshing everybody's memory, or really just straight up reminding everyone since it's been like a year since I've covered necromorphs, the general thinking on this channel is that based on differences in your meat suit and also where you fall, basically creates what you are. So say like the stalkers attack you on Titan Station, they're actually confirmed twins and share sort of a pre-mortem link with each other, which allows them to operate and move as a pack. The slashers are just your run-of-the-mill creatures spawning as normal. Roots and tripods are those that fell in a group or were placed there by necromorphs post-mortem, things of that nature. To add, however, exposure clearly demonstrates that an outbreak is evolving as it continues. Those that fell earliest and have continued to have exposure to the marker signal will then begin to become a cohesive unit which results in stronger necromorphs as the storyline continues. These are the slashers, leapers, that we really see them sort of forming this greenish-black skin and glowing orange or red eyes. They are harder to cut apart as presumed presumably mutations within the body, have continued, which has resulted in a stronger than normal joint connection and likely more bone formation on the outer skin to protect them from melee hits. The marker, seeing as it's a conduit for the Brother and Moons, also punishes those who resist. Some humans have shown the innate ability to resist the influence of these markers, whether it be Lexine, whose apparent iron will is able to override not just the marker signal in her own brain, but also create an area of proximity, allowing others to cancel out the marker as well. All the way to Isaac, who is in no means actually immune to the signal, but would have changed had he been taken out by Nicole and had not destroyed the neuron within his own brain replicating the same signal. And from what we have seen, it's usually intellect that allows people to override the signal at least for a short period of time, whereas people who are deemed not as mentally capable will fall extremely quickly. So presumably others have this ability as well, which is not looked on favorably in any capacity by the moons. Those that may have been resistant, or at least partially resistant but unlucky, would succumb to the signal, likely due to a necromorph attack, but their brains may have been somewhat intact. The Guardians in particular track with this pattern with their screams of pain upon ejecting the pods from their midsection. It almost appears to be like a punishment. Another necromorph that can possibly be categorized into this section would be the exploders who are heard talking to themselves quietly should they not know where you are. This would indicate the mind is still functional to some degree after becoming a necromorph. Which brings us to the Nest. Born from the corruption, the Nest is a much stronger area denial creature tasked with guarding the zero-g environment and potentially taking out approaching or fleeing ships. This clearly indicates that their purpose is planned to counter human or alien in terms of Tal Volantis means of escape, and because of this and the state that we find them in, it would seem that their brain would likely still check off the intact box, which may allow them to think to some degree, but with that said, they cannot control their own bodies anymore. And remember, this is still possible because at the end of Dead Space 2, remember that Isaac just javelins himself to the face if he uh, messes up. So he's still in there, but he doesn't have control of his body. But before getting to the hypotheticals of this creature, we must first talk about their morphology real quick to understand what they are and what they're doing out in space. So I've got bad news. Due to the fact that the nest, as mentioned previously, is born out of the corruption, she ain't got no feet. What she does have is a massive conglomeration of organic tissue at the connection point 
to the hull. Likely consisting of many different people melted down for their biomass, this serves not only to anchor her, but also protect her by shielding and providing support should someone attack or the gravity in the area be turned back on. Moving up to where we can assume the legs are, we see that largely they have suffered the same fate as the people below her. Likely not just her legs, but a fusion of other people's biomass, these multiple people will be needed further for the projectiles, which we will cover in a moment when we get to those. Moving up to the midsection, we begin to see that this person isn't exactly alone. On the front, it's quite clearly a woman, as seen by the, well I can't really say otherwise this video will get demoed, but uh, you get the idea. You can see possibly what appears to be the remnants of her ribcage right around the front, but if you move around the back, you actually see there's another person connected to her. My thinking is, is that these two women who were actually fused together did so when they met their end, which may explain why she looks like the woman from Total Recall. Moving further up to the shoulders, we see that she has been beefed up quite a bit. This is likely because on the inside, the arms are actually hollowed out to allow the projectiles the ability to move through, so then they can be fired out at the base of the arms through the hands. And speaking of arms, the lower parts concerning the forearms have been covered with the same yellow concoction that the exploders have. The reason for this would likely be a controlled blast within the forearms that allows the firing of these projectiles. This would make sense seeing as the nest will enter a refractory period after the firing of these projectiles, where the chamber would need to be refilled essentially in order to fire again. The hands still have all five fingers, and at its center, a slight membrane covers the palms, or really what used to be the palms. This will open up to allow the projectiles to be let loose, and would close back to prevent possibly the desiccation of internal tissue due to the environment that it's in. And of course, as you can clearly see, this creature has three arms, with one of them on the back from the other person, who may have actually succumbed to injuries like an arm severing. Moving up to the head, apart from the female tripod, this appears to be the only other necromorph who retained the hair on their head. Hair is strange to see on necros because of the conversion process they seemingly destroy as all hair follicles on the body for most, but it's not entirely impossible for some of them to still remain on the body. And judging by the fact that the body, while obviously mutated and fused, still retains some of its former appearance with a face clearly seen, the head appears to be largely untouched by the transformation process. Now, I'm going to stop myself right there, because even though the head does appear to be somewhat normal, it's actually much larger than Isaac's head with his helmet on. In fact, the entire body is larger in proportions. Now, this could be due to things like biomass added, which undoubtedly it is in some capacity. However, I believe what's really happening to this necro is during its formation, the creature is influenced more so by its environment. Now, to understand why it ended up this way, as in way larger, we must understand what happens to humans in zero-g environments, and also what happens to us in space should we be exposed. So first things first, what happens if you're, say, like, shot out of an airlock? You actually do not explode. With your standard meat suit, you can survive actually up to a minute in the vacuum of space, and even up to maybe a minute and a half. Granted, it's agonizing for your body, but it does put up some resistance. Every mucous membrane in your face, like your eyes, nose, mouth, will instantly have the water boil in them due to the low pressure, and then freeze, which is uh, likely probably a very interesting experience. But what really happens that creates issues is you actually suffer from the bends. The bends is when nitrogen in your blood is under so little pressure that it begins to form gas bubbles. A lot of people have gotten it from diving and then ascending to the surface too quickly. You actually have to sit in a decompression chamber for an extended period of time to make sure your body can reabsorb the nitrogen, or you risk things like embolisms and strokes. Not a great feeling. So in space, this happens extremely quickly. This means the nest would need some way to overcome this glaring issue, and it may have affected her morphology. So a possible way to overcome this, I believe, is the distension that we see in the body in many areas, which is actually a collection of nitrogen gas. This has also made her increase in size as the internal pressure of her body is literally pushing against the vacuum of space to escape. This would indicate that the skin would likely have to be a lot thicker than you or I have, and it would seem that the biomass from others probably do cover her to create this kind of barrier between the nest body and space. But this pressure gradient has made her appear larger concerning her body, and couple that with the added biomass from the person on her back, this would likely account for size. Now concerning zero G, imagine being turned into a necromorph is sort of like being reborn. Your body changes under the environmental conditions it exists in. What would end your eye is simply a shaping mechanism for necromorphs. So I guess the unitologists actually understood this in some capacity, considering they were screaming about being reborn, but uh, just not in a good way being reborn. Regardless, humans in zero-g hypothetically would be changed. And I say hypothetically, but we are pretty sure we have a good idea of what happens due to changes in animals that we have seen. First things first, our heads would be larger, much larger. On top of this, we would be taller and could afford to be more spread out concerning our bodies. And this is even possible in places with lower gravity, not just necessarily zero-g, like if we go to Mars. In fact, if we ever do make it there and don't say like uh, nuke ourselves into oblivion like a bunch of stupid apes who just found fire for the first time, then likely those born on Mars through successful generations will look less and less human as they adapt to the planet. This would also likely result in more C-sections being performed as heads grew larger. And apart from that, again, since this is like being reborn, these creatures 
creatures are larger in scale than their standard homegrown human. But there's a downside to zero-g environment influences. Bones become more weak and frail. And in fact, the material used to make them just kind of starts sloughing away because there's less fractures to repair and even little tiny micro fractures that your body usually does on a daily basis. So the nest is no exception to this. After the transformation, it would appear that the bones and the arm were lost and then reabsorbed by the body. This creates the hollow tube used to fire these projectiles. Another area where bones is lost is obviously the legs, but most importantly is the spine. The spine of the nest appears to be completely gone. In fact, if you turn back on the gravity without taking out a nest, it will simply flop over as it cannot support itself, but normally it will actually disappear into the flesh cocoon to seek support and make sure it doesn't damage itself. But were these bones destroyed or just moved elsewhere or possibly even just reformed elsewhere? As we know, the body is used, reused, and then repurposed for a third time with necromorphs. If you are wondering how, then look no further than the projectiles fired. As we all know, the corruption is simply those who are unlucky enough to be used as biomass, although if you get turned at all, you're pretty unlucky. But by the same token, the corruption can grow on its own like a cancer, changing its environment it's in and then sealing shut entire sections of ships and stations. The corruption is fully human with genetic coding stored within each piece of this. This was confirmed after the marker was destroyed in Aegis 7 and the doctors on the ship found that all of the sludge contained human DNA. But in the presence of the marker, it forms and shapes not only things like cysts, but in this case, the nest. And it has a major hand in supplying the creature with what it needs. So taking a look at the projectile, it's clear that this is a spinal column with a brain at the top. Likely, these come from the people who were a part of the corruption. With the spine showing all the vertebrae even down to the tailbone, the infected brain, which is no longer necessary for the corruption to have, sits at the top containing the same yellow liquid all explosive variants of necromorphs have. These projectiles also have the ability to move in zero-g environments quite effectively and at the same time can actually direct their course after being fired out of the arms of the nest. So here's what I believe the chain of events are for those who have become the corruption. After their subsequent disassembly, their spines and brains are sent up to the nest. Once they are moved up through the abdomen, they likely absorb a certain amount of nitrogen and gas while in this pressurized environment. Upon being fired out by the arms, which is actually by controlled explosions, they are sent into the environment, which in some cases may have no atmosphere at all. They are directed to the non-infected and can actually use the gas stored so that they can influence their trajectory, but in being fired, it would appear trauma happens to the spine and brain, making it unstable. When this happens, should it miss its target or hit its target, it really doesn't matter. It will detonate a short time after regardless. So the question that should be on everyone's mind now is, how does this thing sense you. With a guardian, it's pretty clear that it can hear you. Vibrations in the air give away your position, considering it's an open hallway or near a door. For cysts and the corruption, the corruption can actually feel you walking on it and understands based on pressure if you get close to a cyst formation that you are a target. With the nest though, this is why I believe its brain is still largely intact. With a lot of necromorphs, notice that the face is altered and changed in some way. Eyes are lost a lot of the time unless you are like a slasher, but in the case of the nest, all the facial structures are still there. We have seen in the multiplayer, and if that's anything to go concerning on lore, they can sense the electrical activity in your body and that you are not infected. So the marker can designate electrical activity in the body as either marker approved or human resistance. However, given the range that the nest can see you, I would have to say it's more than that. The brain is allowed to stay somewhat functional to continue relaying sensory information. Now the eyes are probably damaged from being in space to some degree, but with that said, I believe the creature still uses them for their intended purpose. This would allow them to see humans and ships from further away and then react accordingly. Then should you you get close enough upon sensing your electrical activity, the creature will then curl back up into the safety of its flesh sack until it can no longer sense how close you are. This mechanism is ingrained so it can continue to lob projectiles from further away, seeing as it has no up close game should a human get close. Much like any of the other exploders, this creature has the ability to completely blow apart a human. On top of this, after its detonation, the spinal vertebrae is then splintered and shot out to form a type of organic shrapnel to pierce rig armor and likely would just take out anyone not wearing any armor. However, this same material that is used to fire out the spines and brains can be used against it. Taking out the three chambers of the arms renders the creature incapacitated. However, considering it doesn't dismember it, likely this creature is only temporarily put down and later the corruption will repair and reform these arms for further use or it will be reabsorbed. Because really, nothing ever meets its end once the marker has it until the marker is destroyed. So shout out to the Facebook group Necroposting Trademark. Keeping the dream alive, guys. I enjoy the memes. And indeed, I am amongst you.